So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Today we're speaking with New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Dan Siegel. He's just come out with AWARE, the science and practice of presence. And that's not what's under the tree at Christmas time, okay? The book, this book is really an in-depth look at the science that underlies meditation's effectiveness. This book teaches readers how to harness the power of the principle where attention goes, neural firing flows, and neural connection grows. I like that. That's, that's very nice. So, okay, tell me more about this. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that we now know from science that if you do a regular practice of focusing your attention in particular ways, ways we could talk about, you actually do a number of things in the brain that include basically growing particular networks that are what are called integrated. They link differentiated areas together. That's what integration is. And we could talk about the specific areas, but the overall frame for brain plasticity, for how the brain changes in response to experience, is that you can use your mind to change the structure of your brain. And that actually can cultivate a kind of brain functioning that develops resilience, insight, and emotional balance in your life. Then there are a whole bunch of physiological changes we can talk about, but that's just to address the brain aspect of it. Okay, so you know, you're obviously a neuroscientist. In fact, you're a psychiatrist. Yep. Uh, how did, how, you know, as a psychiatrist, did you get interested in meditation in, as a psychiatrist? Let's start there. Sure, well, it kind of was through a very strange way, I gotta say, you know, I was actually trained as a scientist First, you know, as a college student, biochemist, but then when I was in my postgraduate years, I learned to study relationships between babies and their parents called attachment. So it was in the beginning of the decade of the brain, and I had been very interested in how experience shapes the structure of the brain from my days in medical school. My teacher of neuroscience, David Hubel, won the Nobel Prize when I was in school for showing that the experiences that we have changes literally the structure of the brain. And so that's basically how I began learning about neuroscience was through Dr. Hubel's teachings. And, you know, this finding when I entered pediatrics and then went into psychiatry always stayed with me. And when I was a researcher in attachment, I started asking questions like, why does the attuned communication of a parent to a child, the way a child can have the experience where a parent tunes into their inner feelings and the meanings of things, not just their behavior, but what's actually going on in their inner mental life, why does that attunement lead to a positive outcome in the child's life? And if you don't have that attunement, it actually compromises the growth of the brain of the child. So. I actually started more in terms of relationships and seeing the mind as actually both relational as well as an output of the brain and the whole body. So that was before I ever used the word meditation in my life. And then when I wrote a book on that um, called The Developing Mind, uh, my daughter's preschool director said, will you please teach some workshops on parenting? So I did that and she and I ultimately, Mary Hartzell and I wrote a book called Parenting from the Inside Out, and we said parents should be conscientious, intentional, aware, awake, you know, and kind in what they did. We wanted a word to summarize all that stuff. So we said, okay, well, how about this phrase? How about be mindful? And when we published this in the book and parents would read the book in classes, they would say, when in this class are you gonna teach us to meditate? And literally Mary and I, who are not meditators, said, what? And they go, your book says meditation is a fundamental principle. And we said, what book are you reading? They said, Parenting from the Inside Out. We said, show us. And they would say, it says here, be mindful. We said, that means be conscientious, caring, intent, all this stuff. They go, no, 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 it's a form of meditation, which I didn't know about. 
And I said, what kind of meditation? They go, mindfulness meditation. So that began back in 2004, probably around there, a whole series of things that kind of coincidentally happened where I was put on a panel with a guy named John Kabat-Zinn, who kind of translated uh, Buddhist meditation for medical use and mindfulness-based stress reduction. And he and I were on a panel together. He said, you don't know anything about meditation. I go, absolutely not. But the attunement of parent-child relationships looks like it produces the same outcome as mindfulness meditation, whatever that is. And he said, go meditate. So I went to meditate. So I wrote a book called The Mindful Brain, suggesting that the attunement that you do in mindfulness meditation is an internal form of attunement, whereas the parent-child relationship that I studied is an interpersonal form of attunement. And that's probably why they were leading to the same integrative changes in the brain was my hypothesis and experience of well-being in both a relational attunement and an internal attunement. So that's to answer your question. That's kind of the back door <laughs> is how meditation became a part of my life. So wait a minute, I, got, I got two questions. So if I'm out playing with my grandchildren yep. and I'm sitting here like this going, oh, that's nice kids. Uh, you're, you're probably telling me that I'm not going to connect with uh, my kids or my grandkids. Is that exactly. number one? That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. Good. Now, number two, he, he says, okay, I want you to go out and meditate. Uh, that's, we're going to talk about that, obviously, but okay, so here's a meditator saying, you know, you're, you're all full of it, go meditate, and then you'll understand. Right. Can you just tell somebody to go meditate? Well, you know, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, you know, had a lot of, um, you know, expertise behind him. You know, he's a, a world's leader in this. And the panel to me was really fascinating. I really trusted him. So I, my first time meditating pretty much was doing a week-long silent retreat with 100 scientists. And, ah. uh, that, and that, that was kind of, <laughs> I don't recommend that as a way to start, but I had been doing something called the wheel of awareness before that, uh, which I never would have called a meditation before. It was to me, um, an exercise to help grow the brain in integrative ways that I had been doing with my patients, but I never would have called a meditation. It was just a reflective exercise, kind of like, you know, you have relaxation techniques and stuff like that. This wasn't so much to relax things, but it was taking two ideas that this integration, this differentiation linkage was health and consciousness is needed for change. And then I just asked the question, well, what if you integrated consciousness and my patients who had anxiety or mild to moderate depression or trauma, this wheel of awareness thing, which we can talk about, you know, it just helped them. So I, I saw it as a therapeutic tool. And in fact, on that week long silent retreat, you're able to talk a little bit. I actually tried to present it to one of the teachers and he said, don't be so sure of yourself. So uh, I got a little nervous about the wheel and just sort of kept it in my um, private practice without making it public. <laughs> but I, I, I would have just called it a reflective well, it, exercise. It's public in here now, now it's your public. wheel. <laughs> All right. Because I'll tell you, I, I did it with 10,000 people systematically in workshops. And once the results were so universal and so positive, you know, I, I actually had my publisher come to one of those workshops and she just said, you got to turn this into a book and Sarah Carter. So I said, you know, that's probably, it's probably time to do it. But that, that's now many, many years later, because it's like, you know, 14 years later. So I learned about the mindfulness meditation world while being an active psychotherapist. And, you know, it was very interesting to me, you know, because psychotherapy is not the same as meditation. But it involves an attunement in, in psychotherapy, just like with attachment, you're attuned. So there was something profound about these forms, I think, of integration of energy and information flow, whether it's directed by your own mind in a, in a solo meditation or it's in a relational communication. I think they're both creating states of integration is what I think. And so so it, I, I started to feel at home and then, you know, I started teaching with John and teaching with other meditation teachers. And I didn't have much background, but, you know, I began to learn from them and, you know, saw that the wheel of awareness, which they said should be called a form of mindfulness meditation. John Kabat-Zinn did it and said that. And then Jack Kornfield did it and said that. So then I said, OK, you know, I'll come out of the closet and just start teaching it and see how it goes. You know, and, and so the workshops have been very educational for me to 
you know, not just with my patients, of course, you know, they want to, you know, keep the relationship going. So I, I, I didn't want to use that as data. So I just wanted workshop participants who could just be honest about how it went and um, just systematically as a scientist collected it from 10,000 participants, whoever took the microphone, you know, a certain percentage of those 10,000 and then got that data. And then once that was done, the question was, you know, what exactly is going on in the mind that these universal findings would come out if you could put the knowing of consciousness and differentiate it in a hub, metaphoric hub, put the knowns on the rim and systematically link them with the spoke of attention, people would have these incredible experiences over and over and over again, that is different workshop participants have similar experiences. So then in the book I talked about what I think is likely going on, it's a hypothesis and I'm working with some brain scientists to see if you can get a neural correlate with it, I'm working with physicists to see if it corresponds with uh, conservative approaches to understanding the nature of energy. And it's been very exciting, very, and I'm really excited with this book coming up because, as you say, you know, it's the first in-depth description of the mechanisms of mind beneath the wheel of awareness. And uh, so I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how people take it on. Yeah. So, so you know, you're, you're a scientist. You, you went to Harvard. I went to Yale. So obviously our, our, brain, oh yeah, our brains were affected very differently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, I trained at the NIH and you were an NIH uh, fellow at UCLA. Yeah. And so you've approached this, as I do, from, you know, scientific background, which I think we actually have to do whenever we get into the, the spheres of alternative medicine. I hate that word, but we'll, we'll use it. Um, so give me some of the, the scientific uh, basis and benefits of meditation that you and others have found. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I want to really honor the scientists, Dr. Gundry, because as you're pointing out, you know, it's, a, it's hard work to be, stay conservative to the empirical findings, have frameworks of knowledge, um, and then, you know, then also as clinicians, you know you have to be trained in the science, but then you have to apply it in as conservative way, but as useful way as you can. And for a while, not so long ago, like let's say, you know, 15 years ago, maybe even even more recently, you know, the word meditation was thought of as like woo-woo and weird yeah. and, you yeah. know, out there. And so I really want to honor the hard work of scientists like John Kabat-Zinn and Richard Davidson and Shauna Shapiro and many, many others, and Mishi Jha, and there are tons of other people we can name, Judson Brewer, you know, so I just want to name some of them. There are many more I'm not naming, and I want to apologize to them, but, you know, because their hard work has taken the word meditation from something that people understandably be skeptical about and moved it to a level of really a practice kind of like, um, I think the, 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 maybe the best way to start is, it's kind of like exercising your body. You know, I know when, when my wife, first, she was telling me the story the other day, because she's a, a longtime meditator actually, she first jogged and she grew up on a farm and her parents said, don't you get enough exercise walking around? Why do you have to run around, you know? And she said, no, I feel good jogging, you know? And, and there was a time when people thought physical exercise like didn't make much sense. And now we know it's actually really important for the health of your whole being, including your brain. Um, and meditation in a similar way is, you know, exercising your mind to actually strengthen the circuitry of your brain. And in addition to growing those integrative areas that we said that makes the brain more nimble and resilient, that's what research very clearly shows. The following five findings are kind of mind-blowing and if you listen to these five findings it said a pharmaceutical company found a pill that creates these changes you would take it and you would invest in that company like that well these findings are published in the most rigorous peer-reviewed scientific journals in the world and I sent this book out to my peers to make sure I had it down right and you know they gave me positive responses so that's good in fact one of them even wrote back this is Alyssa Eppel, who wrote a book called The Telomere Effect with the Nobel Prize winning researcher, her colleague, Elizabeth Blackburn. She said, Dan, everything you write is correct. 
you just left something out. Has your book gone to the printer yet? And it hadn't gone yet. I said, no, it's going like in two days. What's up? What did I leave out? She said, you need to also say, in addition to things that I said, it slows the aging process. And I said, get out of here. How can I say that? She goes, this is like the world's expert, Elizabeth Blackburn and Alyssa Apple, the world's experts in aging. She said, that's what the research shows. So let's start with that one. Why does Alyssa Apple say that? Why does Elizabeth Blackburn say that? Because when you develop open awareness, a receptive way of being called presence, you're actually optimizing an enzyme called telomerase that repairs and maintains the caps on your chromosomes that are called telomeres. And it was that system that Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for discovering. Well, one of the best predictors of telomerase levels and then therefore that optimize the ends of your chromosomes so make your cells healthier and have more long lives and you are healthier and have a longer life because you're composed of these cells um, is mental presence. Being aware of what's happening as it's happening and not getting swept up by judgments or just distracted by all sorts of other things, but being here for what's happening. That's what presence is. It's not something mysterious, you know, and mental presence is one of the best predictors of optimizing telomerase levels keeping your cells healthy and slowing the aging process. So that's amazing. What else do you do? You actually change the epigenetic, that is non-DNA molecules that sit on top of the genome. These are histones and methyl groups that change the configuration of certain genes. In this case, the gene responsible for inflammation so that with mental presence, you're actually optimizing the configuration of the epigenetic regulators to reduce inflammation in your body. And as you know, now we know inflammation is one of the key common elements of the major diseases of our time. So if right. you can reduce inflammation, wow. So that's awesome. Number three, you improve your immune function. So you can fight infections better. Number four, you optimize cardiovascular risk factors like reducing cholesterol lowering blood pressure, you know, creating what's called heart rate variability coherence, right? This means your system is more integrated, basically. And then number five is you reduce stress. The stress hormone cortisol is reduced. So if we said, here, we've discovered a pill that does it, well, we have. It's, you know, the word meditation just means training your mind. It's training your mind to cultivate presence. So it's, you know, I consider it an integrative meditation. Um, that's just my take on it, but whatever it has three pillars. It's cultivating focused attention open awareness and what I call kind intention or compassion and kindness You know, these are the three pillars that are underneath the kinds of meditative practices that produce these five physiological um, mechanisms of health and grow integration in the brain. So there you go so why not? why not? You know, you mentioned, you mentioned stress and cortisol. So why is it that meditation is such a good stress reliever? What, what is the mechanism that you've discovered? You know, there, and are, others. there are a number of theories about that. And do you like to be called Dr. Gundry or Steve? I'll do whatever you want. Either way. All right, I'll be formal. Dr. Gundry, because you're from <laughs> Yale. I know what you like from Yale. There you go. <laughs> so, Dr. Gundry, you know, there are a number of theories about that. Here's one way to think about it. You meditate, which just means training the mind, in a given session, let's say your 12 minute a day session, which Amishi Jha was just teaching with her, a wonderful researcher from the University of Miami. She says in her studies, that's like a minimum daily. You know, I have a practice, you do 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day, whatever. But it's good to think of a dozen a day, but it, it might be less that you can do too. But a regular practice, let's just say the research is really pointing to regularity, kind of like brushing your teeth. You don't say, hey, I brushed my teeth last summer. You know, <laughs> you don't do that. You, you want to do it on a regular basis, even if you're not doing the two and a half minutes, whatever. Okay. So instead of dental Re hygiene, Really? Uh, we're supposed to brush every day? I mean, I saw new research that said flossing doesn't help. <laughs> oh, they, no, I'm just joking. Yeah. Or it's like the dentist says, you say, which teeth should I floss? Just the ones you want to keep. 
<laughs> so it's a, all right. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. It's great. It's, it's so the issue is the same thing. You know, it's mind, hy mental hygiene. Maybe it's mental flaws. I don't know. But it's um, it's the idea that you're you're taking care of your hygiene of your mind. Now, what does that mean? This means that you create a state. I think it's an integrative state, and we can talk about what that means in the brain and the body. And in that state, when it's repeated over time, it leads to neuroplastic changes that allow you to deal with life stresses in a very different way so that you basically become uh, filled with a trait of resilience. Now, from a mind point of view, here's the way to think about it. If consciousness is like a container of water, and the stresses of life are like a tablespoon of salt. Many people have a container of consciousness that's like the size of a, an espresso cup, it's small. And when life dishes out a tablespoon of salt and you dump it into a espresso cup amount of water, what does that taste like? Pretty salty. Pretty salty, that's stressful to drink it, right? Now, what the wheel of awareness, just to give you one example of a meditation, which puts the awareness in the hub and the things you're aware of on the rim, it basically takes a small hub, that espresso cup size, and teaches you how to make it really, really big. Let's just say for numbers say 100 gallons. Now, life dishes out from the rim the same stressor, which is a tablespoon of salt. You now have a ready container of 100 gallons, not the small espresso cup, and you put the salt in that, what it, and you stir it up, what does it taste like? Nothing. Nothing. It's fresh water. That's, I think, why stress is reduced. Because when you literally expand the container of the mind's awareness, this is why the book I wrote is called Aware, when you expand awareness, everything changes. And when Alyssa Eppel and, and myself and two of my interns, um, Suzanne Parker and Ben Nelson, when we wrote up a paper trying to address this exact thing, we use the mechanisms of mind that I explore in the aware book to try to understand why telomerase levels are optimized, why you're actually reducing inflammation, and why stress is reduced. So I think what that expanded container of consciousness is, is a way of shifting literally the way the whole body functions, and that is a state of presence. So, since you brought up the wheel of awareness, tell me, you know, how this works. Uh, how does someone go to their happy place, which is kind of what I think you're saying uh, for our viewer. So, how does the wheel of awareness work? Yeah, well, it's interesting because a happy place can be like an image like of myself at the beach or something like that. And for relaxation techniques, that's what we do, you know, imagine a happy place. This may be a happy place, but it can often be something quite new to people that's really an incredible resource that certainly brings happiness, but it brings more too than just relaxation. So, it, it, you know, it's an interesting thing to, to think about that. But so let's say how you do this. So basically, it's a very simple practice. For a young child, it would be just a drawing of the wheel with a sense of knowing in the hub and the knowns on the rim. Like we said, if I say hello, you can know that I said hello, and you also have, that's the hub, and you have the knowing on the rim. So basically, if it's an adult doing this, or an adolescent, you do it as a reflective practice. If you want to call it meditation, great. You don't need to. Meditation just means training the mind. Here, if you're going to use that term, you want to say, what kind of meditation is it? It's an integrative meditation. It's integrating consciousness. Um, so how does it do it? You imagine yourself in the hub with the rim around the hub, and then you send a spoke of attention out to the first segment of the rim, and then systematically you go from hearing, the first sense, you let hearing go, you go to sight, the light coming in your eyes, then you go from light to, to smell, to taste, to touch, and you then have the training of focused attention for each of those senses. Then you take a deep breath, you move the spoke over, and people do this you know, from my website where people stream it, or you can memorize and do it yourself, then you go to the interior of the body. So this is registered in a very different part of the brain, for example, it's interoception. And we can talk about the brain circuits if you want, but the point is that now you're going inside the body, the sensations of muscles and bones, 
and then to the genitals, the intestines, the respiratory system, and the heart. And so you're bringing into awareness these sensations again, one by one. So you do one, you let it go, then you go to the next. And then when you're doing that, it's also focused attention. So that's the first pillar of mind training. You now move it over to the third segment of the rim. And now we experience the training of open awareness, where you just invite any kind of mental activity, any emotion, thought, memory, idea, hope, dream, longing, desire, belief, anything into awareness. And this for many people is kind of a shocker because so often we're focusing on the rim and that's great, but now you're really kind of centering yourself more in the hub. So it's an interesting thing to hear the descriptions where people say, whoa, I invited anything in, but nothing came. And for the first time in my life, I felt incredibly peaceful. Oh my God, that was amazing. And so that's why you might call it the happy place, but it's not a particular image of a place. It's actually pure awareness. Then you have people explore what it feels like to have a thought, for example, as one mental activity example, arise, stay present and go away. And then you even in a more advanced step, have them bend the spoke around so they experience pure awareness of awareness. And that's kind of a mind blowing moment, which is really exciting to talk about. And then you straighten the spoke out or send it out to the fourth and final segment of the rim. So you're aware of your connections, your connections to people sitting next to you, people in your family, your friends, people you work with, people who live in your community, people who live in your city, your state, your country, all of humanity and all living beings. And this gives people a deep sense of I belong here as a member of the living ecosystem of Earth. And it's a beautiful moment to hear people's reflections on that. And then, you know, when I presented this to a, a, a esteemed neuroscientist lab, Richie David's lab, his researchers had just completed a study, which now there are many of, and they said, if you add to your fourth segment of the rim verbal statements people say inside their mind, we've shown it actually leads to these positive changes in the brain and physiology and, and even behavior. And then I found that other research labs have done the same thing. And so I incorporated that in the wheel also. So basically you make statements of kind intention towards all living beings, towards yourself and toward an integrated sense of who we are. And, um, and that's the end of the practice. So it takes about 20 minutes in one version. You know, I have a seven minute short version for people on the go, you know, but, but it's good to start with the longer one and just get used to all the elements of the wheel. And so basically what you're doing is differentiating huff from rim and all the rim elements from each other and then linking them together. So that's why we call it an integration of consciousness practice. It's very accessible and it's amazing to hear how people take this into their lives. So, um, so help me with this. A lot of people, when you say the word meditation, that you think of we're all in flowing robes or yoga pants, and yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're saying a, you know, a word, om, and we're trying to completely shut our brain down. What, what I'm hearing from you is that that's not actually what your program of awareness is. Uh, am I getting that right? You're getting it exactly right, and you know, it's built on the idea that integration is health and consciousness is needed for change. So if you're to grow towards health, you could integrate consciousness. It turns out it has what research has shown are the three pillars of effective aspects of training the mind. Focusing attention is not just emptying the mind, it's stabilizing the mind. Opening awareness is really distinguishing the hub from the rim, if you will. And this gives you incredible uh, power. And I'll give you an example of a young boy who learned how to do this, and it was just amazing. And then kind intention is where you release natural ability we have to become aware of our interconnections and to bring a positive attitude towards our inner life and the life inside of others as well. And so this is, um, you know, when, when people have the image, oh, you should have no thoughts and nothing going on, the part of that that does, I think, have an element of truth is you want to be, be um, learning that pure awareness has no thoughts, but you don't need to just sit in the hub. It's about integrating the rim and the hub, honoring them both. You know, so like when you drive a car, you need to take a rim element, which is like pressing on the brakes at a red light, or you will become one with everything. 
you know, you, you need to you need to have both rim and hub, and there's a whole mechanism view of that. So, it, but it is saying that you need to be able to realize you have the power. I'll give you an example of Billy, five year old, picked out of one school for beating up a kid in his prior school, comes to a new school. In that kindergarten, the teacher, kindergarten teacher, let's call her Miss Smith, she teaches every kid the wheel of awareness. On the second day, she writes me an email. She says, Billy comes to her at the break, and she says, you know, recess, she says, Miss Smith, Miss Smith, you've got to give me a break because I'm on the yard. Joey took my blocks. I'm about to hit him, which is what he did at the other school. I'm lost on my rim. I've got to get back to my hub. So she gives him a break. He takes time away, he centers himself, and from that hub is not only he's aware of his impulse to hit, but it puts a pause between impulse and action. And for a lot of reasons that I talk about in the aware book, the hub is the source of other options. So he's also locating his mind in a place where other choices exist. And then he can draw on those and choose to share with Joey. And months later, she wrote me back, he's woven into the classroom beautifully and learn these skills. So in that way, the hub allows you to distance yourself from an impulse, rest in just kind of this open awareness and say, you know, I can be aware of my impulse to hit Joey, but I think that's not a good idea. I think I'll choose some other path. That's what we want to give kids and ourselves. And so, so as a, you know, as a, as a psychiatrist, um, you're telling me that you can take a five-year-old, you know, belligerent kid and turn him into a cooperative human being. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Miss Smith, she's not alone. This is, yeah. I mean, you'd be amazed because kids actually really want to become more integrated. It's, it's often from trauma and other very upsetting situations that they've learned, um, you know, take ways of dealing with the world they come from that don't apply to the school setting, let's say. So you want to give them these resources and every kid has a hub inside of them and nothing is taken away. They can be lost on the rim, you know, to keep that metaphor going. Um, and so a teacher knowing this can look at a child and say, I know you have it in you. Here's a drawing. And amazingly, it's not just Billy, but other kids have responded too. Um, when you're taught about how your mind works, you can let it work in a more pro-social way where you have more emotional resilience and more positive ways of being in the world. Cool. Yeah. So, you, so you're saying there's hope for even a, you know, a heart surgeon like I was trained. You know, we, heart surgeons are supposed to be the nastiest human beings in the world. We're, you know, we're jet fighter pilots uh, who are, you know, you know, ice runs through our veins. Uh, you're saying, you know, you can help me? Well, Dr. Gundry, I don't know if you need help, but let me ask you something. And no, seriously, seriously, let me ask you something, because like I, when I did the surgery rotation at Mass General, I mean, I loved it. They really wanted me to go there and be a resident surgeon. And I love doing surgery because I know you're joking about it, but I thought in many ways, surgeons actually get right to the, literally the heart of the matter. Like, what's the problem? Let's take care of it. And so in that way, it was pretty direct. What I noticed, not just for surgeons, but for medical students, was, you know, people weren't teaching us about our minds. So I remember being in the ether dome there at Mass General and realizing, you know, we were kind of being etherized as students. So recently, actually, I was asked to go to Stanford Medical School and teach all the medical faculty about this thing I do called Mindsight, which is seeing the mind. And the amazing thing was, you know, a surgeon invited me to come. He was the head of continuing education, but the dean of the school was an internist. So the dean gets up there and he says, leave it to a surgeon to an ask a psychiatrist to come to speak to all of us, the medical faculty. And I'm going, oh my God, here we go again. This is going to be troublesome. But then he does this amazing thing. He picks up this piece of paper from the podium and he goes, but let me show you how wrong I was. This morning from the Mayo Clinic, we get this report that even though, you know, five years ago, there were 44% of postgraduate trainees across all the different disciplines were anxious, depressed, or suicidal. They're burning out. Five years later now, that number has gone from 44% to 56%. He goes, we are in deep trouble. And then my whole talk for the rest of the day was, 
building on what the dean said, which is, you know, not just surgeons, none of us learn to take care of our own minds. Even recently, I was asked to speak to all the veterinarians in America, 3,000 in one group, 2,000 in another. They've achieved the highest rate of suicide of any profession, apparently. That's what they said. And, yeah, it's, it's a long story, which we don't need to get into here, but the point is, whether you're an animal physician or a human physician, or anyone, really, we need to teach all of us to take care of our own mind. And it's been amazing to me how that is rarely done. Meditation is just a word for training your mind. And if it bug, bugs people, dump the word. You don't need the word. Let's just use the word mind. If you have subjective experience and consciousness, you've got a mind. And if you've got a mind, you can learn to make your mind stronger. The wheel of awareness is all about doing that. Now you get the benefit of not only getting a stronger mind, you get a more integrated brain, and you get these five physiologically proven as outcomes of well-being. So as you said, why not? And that's what I'll ask you, why not? And that's what the dean said, why aren't we doing something to actually help our own? 56, over half, 56% of our trainees are burnt out some of them suicidal, depressed, anxious. What are we doing? Something's not right. No, you're absolutely right. I have uh, third-year family practice residents rotate through me, through my clinic, and these poor uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I you know I do functional medicine or restorative medicine, and uh, I work. I'll spend an hour with my initial patient and a half hour every time I see them, and. They're trained that if they're gonna make a living, they have to see a patient for 10 minutes maximum and get about 80 people through the door every day or they're done for. Yeah. And you know, the stress levels that these young people, they're young to me now, have uh, thinking about how in the world, it, they can't relate to these people as patients. They're, you know, they're typing on their computer rather than even talking to the patient. Exactly. So you're right. It's we've done a horrible disservice. Oh, uh, I know. I know. It's just it is so sad and we we've got to stop it. And I think what's in, you know, to me what is really um, a powerful starting place is there's a study in 2011 where they did a controlled, you know, blind study where they had, you know, people coming in for a common cold just see, you know, a, a, a general practitioner and in one group, the general practitioner just said an empathic comment like, oh, it's May and you're a student, this must be so hard to have a cold, you know, do this, do this, do this for your cold. And the other group didn't make the empathic comment, um, they just said do this, do this, do this. One group, their immune function and their fighting of the virus was much more robust and they got over the cold a day sooner and that was the group that got the empathic comment, right? So it, you could almost say it's, I mean, I'll say it boldly, it's malpractice to not give physicians the training and the time to be empathic with their patients. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, years ago, I was the consultant for a movie called The Doctor with, with William Hurt. And it's about a heart surgeon who's just this kind of nasty, couldn't care less guy who develops cancer and is suddenly put in the role as a patient. And he sees the lack of compassion or the treatment of him as a human being. And it, you know, it does a real mind warp on him and the long story short of the film, and it's a true story, not about me, <laughs> uh, but it's a true story. And it was about his transformation from being this cold hearted, you know, uh, ice man to realizing that compassion was the healing part. Exactly. And yeah, so we're both on the same yeah. page. Okay. Well, I'll tell you one thing about that that I think is just from a brain point of view. We have these circuits. I call them mind sight circuits. These are circuits that allow you to make maps in the cortex and other areas of the mind of oneself and the mind of others, the subjective experience of oneself and others. So they're mind sight circuits, literally. You can show that when a human being is faced in a situation, whether it's a threat or just feeling that the person in front of them is not similar to them, they literally shut off their mind sight circuits and they treat the individual in front of them as an object, like a chair or a rock 
they dehumanize them. They literally take the humanity out of the individual in front of them. So you can have a person who is actually full of mind sight when they get home, but doesn't use it at all at work. Or what's more common is that you learn to not use it and you don't use it at home either. And your whole life becomes empty, which I think is what the burnout comes from. Anyway, these mind sight circuits are teachable. It's what we need to teach, I think, kids in kindergarten and up. It's what the wheel of awareness teaches. And it's what we need to do for our colleagues in, in our fields of medicine. Okay, so you know, I, I believe you. Uh, you've got the studies to prove it. What do you say to people who, who don't believe any of this? I say, what do you believe in? If the <laughs> science doesn't help you say that what you do with your mind and the focus of attention, the opening of awareness, the development of kind intention uh, in these controlled research studies shows and improves your physiological, um, measurable aspects of well-being, that it changes the structure of the brain in a more integrated way so the brain becomes more regulated. What more do you want? You're absolutely right. Can't, couldn't, have said it, couldn't have said it better. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've got a new book coming out to early next year called The Longevity Paradox. And spoiler alert, there's a whole chapter on how meditation extends your lifespan yeah, good. with scientific studies that prove exactly your points. Yeah, beautiful. So uh, if you, if you want to live well a very long time, uh, meditation really should be a part of everybody's life. I agree. And, and like you say, if you can keep, teach five-year-old, there, there's hope for any of us, I guess. Exactly, exactly. All right. So uh, on these podcasts, we always have one audience question, and they're not necessarily for you. So if, you, if you'll excuse me for a second, I've got a question that actually doesn't relate to you. Okay. Uh, but you might enjoy the answer. Sure. So Steve Thompson writes in, Good afternoon, Dr. G. I was told a local grass-fed farm has Asher cows they milk and sell. By the way, that's a cow from Scotland. Uh, would that be acceptable, or are we still looking at casein A1? Well, Steve, I actually had to look this one up because I didn't know the cow, even though I lived in England and went to Scotland a lot. It's unfortunately a casein A1 cow. So now most Northern European cows are casein A1, including, and it's a very beautiful cow. There's some nice pictures of it on the internet, but you can't have it, okay? So sorry about that. Now, back to Dr. Siegel. So listen, uh, everybody get this book, particularly if you're sitting on the fence, you're worried about, uh, you know, it's touchy-feely, it's woo-woo stuff, I'm not in a flowing robe. Here's the science of why you want to do this. And here's a system for you nerds out there to, you know, here's what I do, here's the steps. He spells it right out. So again, thank you for coming on. Please get this book. It's going to help you die young at a very ripe old age. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Siegel. Thank Appreciate you, Dr. You Gundry. Being here. A pleasure. All right. I'm Dr. Stephen Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.